Hello my friends, my name is Dr. Saeed Kazmi. Welcome to my YouTube channel and in today's video I'm going to talk about the congenital infections of the neonates. So in particularly I'm going to talk about the torch infections uh, which is a group of infections which are transmitted from the mother to the fetus in utero. So without further ado let's start our today's topic straight away but before that for those of you who are watching my channel for the first time please do subscribe to my videos and if you like them please do it share with your friends and don't uh, forget to press the bell notification icon so whenever I upload a new video you are always on board with me. So let's start. Now congenital infections of the neonates or torch infections. So what are these? Now, torch infections basically they are a group of disorders. They're a group of uh, infections to be more precise which are transmitted vertically. Vertically means that there is transmission from the mother to the fetus and it occurs because of the transplacental cross infection. So the mother gets the infection during the pregnancy and then these infections they cross the placenta go into the fetus and then they can damage the fetal organs they can cause a lot of problems in the fetus which either be many which either manifest during the fetal life and can be picked up uh, during the uh, scans antenatal scans or can be picked up later when the fetus is born and when he becomes a neonate and obviously there are uh, manifest signs of uh, these um, congenital infections which can present in a variety of way which I would be talking about uh, later in my lecture. So what are torch infections? Now, torch infections as I told you earlier these are vertical infections which can be transmitted from mother to the fetus in utero and they are further uh, classified into two groups the major group and the minor group. Now the major group is actually uh, those infections which this torch acronym belongs to. So that is toxoplasmosis. So TO stands for toxoplasmosis, R stands for rubella, uh, C stands for cytomegalovirus and the H in this torch stands for herpes simplex viral infections. Then we have got a minor group which contains some more infection that can be transmitted transplacentally in utero from the mother to the fetus and they are HIV. Now, please keep it in mind, HIV is usually perinatal, so it's most of the time it's a perinatal transmission near the time of the birth, but nevertheless, sometimes it can also happen in utero. Uh, parvovirus B19 is another uh, uh, infection which can be transmitted transplacentally. Then we've got syphilis, which manifests as congenital syphilis, congenital varicella, or chickenpox infection, and Last but not the least, Zika virus infection. Zika virus infection has recently been incorporated into the torch infections. Uh, the latest textbook, uh, the Nelson textbook of pediatrics, that is uh, the 21st edition, this talks about Zika virus as a torch infection. So keep it in mind that by classification, they are divided into a major group, which uh, consists of toxoplasmosis, rubella, congenital cytomegalovirus infection, and herpes simplex viral infection. And then we have got the other group, which is the HIV, parvovirus B19, the congenital varicella infection, uh, the congenital syphilis, and uh, Zika uh, infection. So this is the uh, classification. Now, how do they commonly present? How would you know that well, this baby constellation of signs and symptoms basically is something to do with this congenital group of infections which we call as torch. Now, please keep it in mind that all of these infections like toxoplasmosis, rubella, cytomegalovirus, they have got their own characteristic signs and symptoms which you would find that, you know, they are peculiar to uh, each presentation. But nevertheless, how would you know that is it could be one of these torch infections. So usually you know if there is what we call a subtle dysmorphism. So it's not like the classical dysmorphism of Down syndrome where you just look at the child and you know because of the characteristic peculiar facial characteristic but there is a subtle dysmorphism so you know that something is not right. This child either has got um, some you know uh, some form of abnormal face faces or has got uh, very uh, what you call um, untypical type of limbs like short limbs so on and so forth so subtle dysmorphism actually can point uh, that probably this uh, newborn might be having a congenital torch infection 
Then the other thing which uh, might uh, point towards torch infection is uh, an abnormally small or big head microcephaly or macrocephaly so if a baby is born with a small head or if he's got a large head like normally the head circumference at uh, birth is between 33.5 to 30.55 centimeters and then we have got for this age and for different racial characters we have got the two uh, z scores as well so if that is below two z scores or above two z scores then we either call it microcephaly and macrocephaly so if that is present though uh, there could be different uh, differential diagnosis for microcephaly and macrocephaly but it can point to it uh, in, in in that direction bilateral cataracts if a baby is born with cataract in both eyes that is another indication that this child might be having a congenital torch infection or if a child has got thrombocytopenia so thrombocytopenia can exhibit in the form of uh, purpura or you might pick it up on a um, uh, on, on, on full blood count and you see that the platelet count is abnormally low. So that can also point uh, in the direction that the child might be having a congenital torch infection. Hepatomegaly or hepatosplenomegaly though can occur in different types of disorders. Nevertheless, sometime with if the child has got especially got bilateral cats or things can point towards the congenital torch infections. Then if a uh, newborn has got non blanchening rash so non blanchening rash which could be like a petechial rash of thrombocytopenia or it could be the typical um, blueberry muffin rash of extra medullary hemopoiesis in the skin uh, that can point towards a congenital torch infection similarly a child whose brain is affected by congenital torch infection so usually they were when they are born there would be delayed cry or they might not be very active they might have a very poor suck so again among different other differentials you can also think about congenital torch infection and if a child has got limb hypoplasia where the limbs are not fully developed they are short uh, digits are missing or the digits are few so then you should also be thinking about uh, congenital torch infection though there are other reasons as well but as I said one of uh, the reasons could be congenital torch infection so these are some of the common presentations which can make you think that among other differentials which are quite wide you should also keep torch infections in mind and you can work up for them especially if you think that the history and other circumstances are making any sense that this might be at the case okay having said that now let's move on uh, we will talk about these uh, one by one so congenital toxoplasmosis now toxoplasmosis is more common in the developing countries rather than in the developed world usually transmitted by uh, cat feces uh, which are usually uh, you know contaminated with uh, the toxoplasmosis gondii eggs and uh, the mother can get an infection well, usually uh, the infection is not severe in the mothers but if she gets it during the pregnancy uh, well the infection can go on it can cross the uh, placental barrier and then cause uh, different problems in the fetus so usually these uh, fetus uh, these newborns uh, when they are born they would be having chorioretinitis they usually have got diffuse cortical calcification so if you do an uh, CT scan or MRI you will find that they've got diffuse calcification in their brain which we call as diffuse cortical calcification and they usually have got hydrocephalus because of the dilated ventricles and the head size is a bit big as compared to the normal so this triad of chorioretinitis diffuse cortical uh, calcification hydrocephalus please keep it in mind that this is very much typical of uh, toxo plasmosis similar congenital rubella syndrome rubella which is not very common in the developed world because of uh, the MMR vaccination but still quite common in the uh, developing country, especially in the subtropics in the tropics and in South Asia uh, so the mother gets rubella and well she doesn't even know that she's got rubella it might lead to a mild fever a little bit of rash bony pains and then the child if it goes and it crosses the placenta and infects the fetus that uh, baby would be born with a sensory neural deafness usually they have got bilateral cataracts and uh, they have got congenital heart disease so they've got some problem with their heart which could be either a PDA a patent ductus arteriosus or pulmonary stenosis which is actually stenotic of the pulmonary wall or even can have peripheral uh, pulmonary stenosis 
So remember a triad of deafness, bilateral cataracts with congenital heart disease goes more in favor of congenital rubella syndrome. Again, keep it in mind that this is not very common in the developed world. It's more common in the developing countries. Then congenital cytomegalovirus infection. Now this is one of the most commonest torch infections. I mean, it's more common than toxoplasmosis, than rubella, and then any other uh, congenital infection. Now, congenital cytomegalovirus infection, which usually is very subtle infection for the mother, doesn't even know that she has been infected with this thing. And uh, again, even if she has been infected and she has got antibodies, that does not prevent the future infections to cross the placenta and go into the fetus. So very treacherous thing. So usually these newborns are born with uh, periventricular calcification. So usually if you do an MRI CT scan, you will see that the periventricular area, the area which is just parallel and then surrounding of the lateral ventricles, the third or the fourth ventricle has got calcifications. So we call them as periventricular calcification. Sometimes it might lead to intraventricular hemorrhage as well, like you know the bleeding inside the ventricle, and that usually then leads to further neurological complications in the later life. But nevertheless, the newborn who has got um, sensorineural deafness, mostly sensorineural deafness, and periventricular calcification is very much pathognomonic of congenital cytomegaloviral infection. Now also keep it in mind that most of the infections, cytomegalovirus infections, nothing happened that. But if the subclinical infection goes on, the baby would later develop sensorineural deafness. Please keep it in mind because this subclinical infection, if it goes on, the usually it hits the uh, the eighth cranial nerve and that leads to uh, sensorineural uh, deafness. And the other thing, as I said, the characteristic findings are periventricular calcification on CT or MRI. Then congenital varicella infection, congenital chicken box infection. Again, if the chicken box virus crosses the placenta and infects the fetus, uh, usually these uh, newborns are born with lymph hypoplasia and they've got cerebellar hypoplasia as well. So the cerebellum as well as the limbs are not properly developed and uh, you know that they can have problems in the uh, later life and congenital herp herpes simplex virus infection. Now this is usually acquired perinatally and at the time of birth. If the mother has got genital herpes, which is called by herpes simplex virus type two, and the child acquires it while passing through the birth canal. So these babies would be born with, and they would develop fever. They, they might or might not develop a vesicular rash, but because mostly it causes encephalitis. So the baby would be having seizures, uh, would be doing very poorly, poor sac, uh, hypertonic, uh, floppy, as I told you, seizures. And uh, uh, if you do an uh, MRI, that usually shows temporal lobe uh, enhancements. That is very much characteristic of herpes simplex uh, virus infection. But um, it has got treatment. You, if you give intravenous a cyclovir or well, a cyclovir, uh, that can cure the condition. So these are some of the triads uh, or common manifestation of these uh, torch infections. So toxoplasmosis, keep it in mind that it would be chorioretinitis and hydrocephalus. So this is the one which causes big head and the MRI or the CT scan would show diffuse cortical calcification. So MRI findings are diffuse cortical calcifications, toxoplasmosis, congenital rubella syndrome. Remember, it's usually bilateral cataracts, sensorineural deafness, and congenital heart disease. And what sort of, sort of congenital heart disease? Patent ductus arteriosus or pulmonic stenosis. Congenital cytomegalovirus infections, usually asymptomatic, but subclinical infection is the most common presentation and can go on to have sensorineural deafness. And uh, the CT or MRI can show periventricular calcification. Congenital vari varicella chickenpox infection, usually presents with limb and cerebellar hypoplasia while herpes simplex virus infection which is acquired uh, perinatally at the time of the birth would usually present with fever and seizures and temporal lobe enhancement on the MRI. Now moving on to HIV. HIV is more common in the tropical regions, in the subtropical regions. Uh, again, uh, 25% of the transmission can occur perinatally. Usually these babies are born with a low birth weight, uh, 
uh, they also have got failure to thrive uh, later on and if you do the MRI or CT scan that would show calcification of basal ganglia so the basal ganglia calcification is very much typical of congenital HIV infection keep that in mind syphilis which is not very common these days but still quite common in the uh, tropical and subtropical and in the developing world usually syphilis infection uh, if it is transmitted transplacentally uh, in utero to the fetus uh, these babies can have uh, a plethora of different problems they usually when they are born they usually have got a papulosquamous rash which is more prominent on the palms and soles so this is a rash which is papular and then leads to desquamation so there is a sort of a peeling of the skin which might look like you know other uh, conditions like uh, bullous pemphigoid or uh, other bullous conditions uh, but nevertheless it is more uh, typically present on the palms and snow and 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 the sole uh, the other thing are usually snuff snuffles so a lot of a thick mucoid bloody nasal discharge again in the newborn period is very much typical of congenital syphilis and they can have any type of skeletal involvement like osteochondritis and uh, uh, perichondritis and you name it and they can have it so skeletal involvement uh, with the rash discriminating rash on palms and sole and a snuffles uh, with hepatosplenomegaly or lymphadenopathy uh, can point towards congenital syphilis infection so this is usually these are the presentation which uh, happen in a newborn later on they can have uh, uh, what we call as a uh, saber shins uh, which is anterior bowing of the tibia uh, they can have Hutchinson teeth uh, which are pointed uh, incisors or they can have a um, problem with their molars uh, teeth and uh, there can be later brain involvement as well which are again usually happens after two years of age but in neonates it's usually snuffles a desquamating rash on the palms and the soles and a skeletal involvement parvovirus b19 uh, again uh, this is a viral infection and can be transmitted in utero it is usually the most common cause of non-immune hydrops fetalis can be even picked up during the antenatal scans and if you do dopplers you can find it can lead to fetal anemia as well and uh, usually is a fatal condition if there is a massive high drops the child can be born with two fully bloated and usually uh, either they are, they are born uh, they, they, uh, they are born as a stillbirth or usually die uh, soon after birth and last but not the least zika virus Zika virus infection can also infect the fetus in utero and that leads to microcephaly so there's a small head they can have lysencephaly if you do the fundi they will having retinal uh, mottling or macular scarring and typically on an MRI or CT scan they have got what we call as subcortical calcification so subcortical means be, 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 it's not the cortical surface it's slightly below the cortex so that is what we call a subcortical area so subcortical calcifications are very much typical of congenital Zika infection so these are some of the typical features of these uh, torch infections so let's start with some Im images and um, here in on the left side you can see a baby who has uh, got a blueberry muffin rash on his face and uh, abdomen so blueberry muffin rash can occur in congenital rubella syndrome it can occur in congenital uh, cytomegalo uh, virus infection uh, so uh, you can see uh, you can further work up and uh, then uh, know the actual cause uh, what is causing this blueberry muffin rash on the right side you can see a ct scan which is showing some uh, subcortical uh, calcification with hydrocephalus and I told you earlier that subcortical uh, calcifications are very much typical of Zika virus infection so Zika virus uh, has caused this condition uh, moving on there are a few other CT and MRI images so uh, if you look the top left one you would see that this is CT scan is showing uh, enlarged ventricles on the both sides and then you can see that there are subcortical calcification in a rim form all around the brain so these are subcortical calcification and subcortical calcification are very much uh, typical of 
congenital Zika virus infection. In the second one, you can see that there is a rim of calcification surrounding the uh, lateral ventricles and that is periventricular calcification. So periventricular calcification is very much typical of congenital cytomegalovirus infection. Then the third uh, CT scan on the right side, you can see that there is diffuse cortical uh, calcification, diffuse one, it's spread all around the brain. And this diffuse cortical calcification usually occurs in congenital toxoplasmosis. Then in the lower left one, you can see calcification of the basal ganglion regions. The basal ganglion regions are calcified in congenital HIV infection. And then on the right side, in the lower uh, part of the slide, you can see an MRI image. And this MRI image is showing enhancement of the temporal lobe of, uh, of the left side. And that happens in congenital herpes simplex virus infection. So as you saw that different MRI or CT scans can show you different things and most of the times they are very typical though they are not specific sometimes you can have uh, the features of one in the other one as well like you know you can get uh, periventricular calcifications in uh, sometimes even in the congenital uh, rubella syndrome as well uh, but nevertheless most of the time subcortical calcifications would be typical of Zika virus infection Periventricular calcifications are typical of cy congenital cytomegalovirus infection. Diffuse cortical calcification are typical of uh, congenital toxoplasmosis. Uh, calcification of basal ganglia is very typical of congenital HIV infection. And, and temporal enhancement is usually a characteristic of congenital or even acquired herpes simplex viral infection. So keep these things in mind. In exam, sometimes you might get images of MRI and CT scan which give you a scenario and then they ask you for diagnosis. So once again, keep it in mind, if it is subcortical, Zika, if it is periventricular, congenital cytomegalovirus, if it is diffuse cortical, then toxoplasmosis, if it is uh, calcification of basal ganglion, then HIV, and if it is temporal lobe enhancement, then herpes simplex uh, virus. So keep these things in mind. Here is another picture where you can see the soles of a child uh, with desquamation. And again, I told you that uh, desquamating rash in the newborn uh, is very much typical of congenital syphilis. And on the right side, you can see uh, the image which is showing very thick uh, bloody uh, mucoid discharge coming from the nostril. We call it snuffles. And again, in a newborn, it is uh, equivalent of uh, congenital syphilis unless and until proven otherwise. So, now coming to the diagnosis, how do we diagnose? Now the thing is that we, most of the time when the baby is born, so they will be having different features. So it is very difficult just to say like, well, this is congenital toxoplasmosis or this is congenital rubella or cytomegalovirus. Now in developed countries, most of the times during fetal medicine, uh, you know, uh, all the uh, women who are pregnant, they are uh, scanned antenatally, they are booked and uh, proper uh, examination is being done. So uh, they usually have got scans, Doppler scans, as well as if they find something on that, then they can have uh, the fetal medicine specialist involved and then they, they can do cord blood uh, sampling, they can look for viral PCRs in the uh, cord sample and they can make a diagnosis they can even do in utero mri scanning which can pick up conditions of the brain so in developed countries it is mostly diagnosed in utero so you don't need for the fetus to be born to look at the features and then diagnose so most of the time there would be in utero diagnosis made by fetal medicine experts and when the baby is born he already has got a label or a diagnosis but that happens in developed countries in developing countries where things are not that much advanced so again uh, you always have to look for the clinical signs and symptoms you look for the history and then you uh, do your workup so another scenario is if you suspect like you know obviously the mother doesn't give you a you a typical history she might not even know that she was infected with these things so let's say baby is born with bilateral cataracts or he is born with microcephaly or he's got blueberry muffin rash or he's got limb hypoplasia what you will do, how would you work them out? So the first uh, starting point is to do a full blood count, uh, including platelet count. So 
or the thrombocyte opinion low black blood count is presence obviously i told you that in syphilis and in many other conditions you can get thrombocytopenia lfts you have to done because of hepatomegaly is present so you have to look at like alanine transamine as <coughs> as part of transamine so on and so forth you have to do a fundus examination because uh fundus examination under anesthesia can also give you a typical feature uh, like chorioretinitis uh, and uh, these uh, typical uh, features of uh, congenital cytomegalovirus uh, infection and so on and so forth we also do auditory brain stem responses and if they are abnormal it's very important to follow them up with ct scan and mri and i told you that ct and mri can give you uh, some uh, typical uh, features of different uh, congenital torch infections like as i told you if you find periventricular calcification that goes very much in favor of congenital cytomegalovirus infection if there are diffuse cortical calcification goes more in favor of toxoplasmosis so on and so forth but again as i told you that these uh, findings are usually uh, non specific they can occur in other conditions as well so it's important to make or confirm the diagnosis by doing a viral pcr so you can do viral pcr for parvovirus you can do viral pcr for cmv you can do like you know you can do urinary pcr for cmv or saliva pcr for cmv again but in short the answer is pcr irrespective of whether you do it on blood whether you do it on urine or whether you do it on any other body fluid so pcr for viral nucleic acid whether they are the dna viruses the rna viruses would give you a confirmatory answer and would confirm which sort of torch infection it is and syphilis you can do direct dark field microscopy you can do the vdrl uh, test or you can do rapid re uh, reactive antigen test and uh, finally you can also do a culture for uh, spirochetes in syphilis as well uh, so the diagnosis confirmation of the diagnosis would be on viral or bacterial pcrs fine so this was all about uh, 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 torch infections um, again treatment uh, usually if the baby is born with all these things then usually the treatment is to is a multidisciplinary treatment where you treat different uh, things at the same time it might be that you might need input from orthopedic from neurologist from pediatricians and again uh, so they can have a reduced quality of life depending on, on the severity of the condition but nevertheless this is the information which you need to keep in mind regarding torch uh, infections i hope you have understood uh, some of the key features of these torch infections and how do they present if you got any questions or queries put it down in the comment section below and we'll get back to you as soon as possible again if you have liked my video share it with your friends uh, and uh, have a good day bye bye